Bringing the people behind our food to life. Now, the one I'd like to start with today is a sort of a classic in the annals of food screw-ups. And it uh, begins in um, post-World War II, Hudson River, fishermen, they notice something bizarre about the fish. The fish are getting bigger every year. Now, most fishermen don't complain about big fish. But in this case, because these fish were being hooked downstream from a pharmaceutical laboratory, there was some concern that the effect was not entirely natural. And eventually, these stories get back to the, the company itself. And uh, there's a, a staff scientist named Thomas Jukes. And Jukes begins to wonder whether something the company is making is getting into the water. And he, he looks at their new hot new product, it's tetracycline. And, and he, he, it's made through a fermentation process, and the waste product is, is mash. It's basically fermented mash, which the company keeps in these big piles next to the river. That's what they say. They probably just put the piles right into the river. But the point is that somehow the mash is getting into the river and probably into the fish. So Jukes begins experimenting. He's feeding little, little bits of the mash to chicks, and he discovers that they get bigger faster on the same amount of feed. And he, he speculates correctly that the, the antibiotic is getting into the guts of these little guys, these little critters, and it's killing off all the, the bugs. And because the, the chicken, the chick is no longer using its calories to fight off infection, it of course can use the calories to become bigger and stronger. And he tests this on, on all kinds of different animals. It works everywhere. Whether you're talking chickens, turkeys, donkeys, uh, cows. Cows give more milk. Uh, pigs give bigger litters. The, the birth weight is bigger. And, and on, all on the same feed, 25% faster growth. And it feels pretty much like free meat if you, if you consider that feed is the most expensive part of a livestock, most, the biggest cost for a livestock producer. And keep in mind that at the time, this is just after World War II, the United States still has meat shortages. We've got high prices. Worldwide, it's, it's, it's close to a disaster. We've got massive protein deficit. You know, entire populations are at deep risk. So the idea that we can produce meat cheaply it feels very much like a miracle, a solution. Now, the, the practice of sub-therapeutic antibiotics would be one of the pillars of what we would later call the livestock revolution. It essentially allowed us to produce a lot of meat very cheaply. It changed the global diet in many ways for the better. Completely changed the way we looked at food security. Now, that was the good news. The bad news, and it would be several decades before we were forced to confront this, was that there were problems associated with feeding a lot of antibiotics to your livestock. I mean, the first, of course, is that, you can, that the livestock industry has become totally addicted to antibiotics. More than two-thirds of the antibiotics we generate on this planet are fed to our animals. The other problem is, of course, as you know, if you feed just small doses of antibiotics to animals, you don't kill off all the bacteria. You, get, you just kill the weak ones. The strong ones, of course, survive, produce populations of these superbugs, which are resistant to antibiotics. Now, I know this is all quite familiar to you, but keep... Put this in context. Consider what we're, we're, what we're sort of creating here. We're, we're setting ourselves up for a time when we don't have recourse to antibiotics. You know, my son, when he has an ear infection, I was able to go to the clinic and pretty uh, dependably get that cured. The idea that I wouldn't have recourse to antibiotics for something as simple as an ear infection is pretty frightening, and the news only gets worse. If you consider that we won't have treatment for infectious disease, this was not what Thomas Jukes set out to do. Thomas Jukes was not trying to destroy the world. The problem was that Thomas Jukes came from a scientific tradition that believed that the best way to save the world, or at least to understand it, was to pull it apart, break it into its pieces, analyze those pieces, improve those pieces, and then reassemble them, ideally in a more efficient configuration. And this is what we were doing to the food system. And this is what we've done in other sectors. I mean, we've done it in manufacturing. We try to do it in banking with you know, mixed results. <laughs> and we would proceed over the course of the last century to do it through the food system. The idea is that by breaking things apart, by rationalizing, by industrializing, we can drive down costs, improve efficiency, and, it, and, and essentially create a system that's much more productive. And for a time, it absolutely did work. We were able to drive down food costs substantially. When you adjust food prices for inflation and look at what's happened over the last century, it is phenomenal. You really need to do that just to understand how far we've come. And also to understand some of the resistance to some of the solutions that we're going to talk about. Because we have, we, we've, ch we've so changed the notion of food security and the, and the whole sort of dynamic for food production that you really begin to see the corner that we've painted ourselves into. But so the good news is we drove costs down. The bad news is we began to understand that you can, you know, there's a weak link in this industrialization of food. And the weak link is it's food. 
Food doesn't like to be industrialized. I don't want to anthropomorphize food here, but food resists being commodified. Past a certain point, food will push back. And it's this pushback that is the nexus of many of the problems we're dealing with today. I mean, let's, let's consider an analogy. If, if, if we're going to uh, mass produce TV sets and we're going to try to make them as efficiently and cost effectively as possible, then we want to centralize our production in huge plants because, because what? We, we drive down our unit costs. And we want to be able to get our raw materials from as many different suppliers as possible. In fact, we'd like to make those suppliers compete. We'd like to pit one supplier against another to drive down the costs even further. And then inside the plant, we want total flexibility in our production lines. We want to be able to start and stop production, change design in order to meet the changing marketplace. And lastly, we want to be able to take those finished products and ship them to end users, to retailers and consumers as quickly as possible because we don't want to pay holding costs. So this is an efficient system I'm talking about. And when we're using it to make TVs, it's great. I mean, to the extent that we like TVs. <laughs> Maybe I should have picked something else. iPods. But now let's transfer this technology, this model, to food. Let's look at, say, ground beef. Ground beef today is made very much in the same way. We take, uh, we take well, and you've all finished eating, um, or you will be, I guarantee you. Ground, ground beef today is made, uh, in many cases, from spent dairy cows. These are dairy cows that are no longer giving a, a, an economic volume of milk every day. The problem is that they're fairly lean. They don't produce juicy ground beef, so we have to juice up the meat by buying fat from other feedlots. So what you have is these huge processing centers, and we're talking gigantic, with, feed, with input streams coming from feedlots all over the country, and sometimes further. Many different feedlots, all coming into the same location, mixed together in these enormous batches. We're talking multi-ton batches. And these batches are mixed, and then they are shipped to other uh, processors who may then mix them with still more batches, or they may begin to make them into products like hamburger patties, pizza toppings, and these are then shipped on to the end user. Now, when this system works, it's fantastic. I mean, we're talking about driving down costs. This is one of the main tools for driving down costs. The problem is when it doesn't work, when an error is introduced into the system, that error moves through the system as quickly as the ground beef did. And we had a we had a classic example of this two years ago with Topps Meat. You know, here is a, the biggest ground beef frozen patty producer in the United States, presumably someone who knew something, a thing or two about food safety, and yet they had a human error. They mixed one batch with another. And the problem is one of those batches had E. coli in it. And once that E. coli was mixed, they couldn't contain it. It was gone. It was gone. It was out. The only thing they could do was recall all their meat for months, 23 million pounds of hamburger. Think about it, 23 million pounds. I can't quite do the math, but it's a lot of tons. And then what, what did they do? They went out of business. So consider this as a, a model of sustainability, not environmental health, but economic sustainability. Here you have a company that, you know, is, is the system that it uses, the model that it uses, is will inevitably um, have an error because it's, there are human beings involved. And then once that error is introduced, the error will move th so quickly through the product stream that it's impossible to contain. So the only recourse the company has is to recall its entire product line, at which point it goes bankrupt. This is the, this, and, and this model that I've just described, it's not confined to the ground beef industry. It's pretty much how most of the food system is run. You know, we like to think that it's just fast food, but I'm afraid that fast food nation is now the entire nation. And this is the system we have. This is the system. So what are the takeaways here? Well, a couple of takeaways are that you know, we have approached food as if it were not a system. We spent the last century trying to talk ourselves into the notion that food is not a coherent system, that it can be pulled apart. And this is, this is completely shaped the way that we solve our problems, because we solve our problems as if they were independent problems. We don't recognize that the whole system is set up like whack-a-mole. It's where you whack something down, it pops up somewhere else. That is the dynamic of a, of a living system. And yet we treat our food sector as if it were not a living system. So the first takeaway is that, you know, most of the problems that we're dealing with today began as solutions. And the second is, if we don't embrace this system's approach, and if we don't get better at conveying and articulating this, the, this, the nature of this system, then every attempt at solving problems today is simply going to turn into a problem for our kids and their grandkids. That's the takeaway. 